Welcome. I'm going to talk to you today about the Rust programming language and about concurrency. Now, I, I like to know a little bit about my audience, so I'm, I'm wondering how many of you here are mostly to hear about the Rust programming language? Okay. And then how much of you here are mainly, mainly here for the concurrency? That's about half and half. So, or actually, and several of you raised your hands twice. I noticed that. I, uh, so, uh, but okay, great. Well, obviously, there's something for both of you there, and that's that's interesting to note. I mean, obviously, there's a, a lot of interest in Rust as a fairly new programming language, and there's and concurrency is, is always an important thing to learn about. Um, well, you know something. I know something about you. I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. Okay, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about myself. So, um, first of all, I'm from St. Louis, uh, right, right here in St. Louis, I'm local. And uh, I work mainly in game development. And uh, for the almost 10 years now, I've worked for NVIDIA. Uh, if you are a PC gamer, you've probably heard of NVIDIA. Maybe it powers the graphics in your computer. Um, NVIDIA actually does a lot of other things, including AI, automotive applications, and all sorts of stuff. But what I work on is putting new tech into game engines, which means most of my work is in C++. In fact, I don't use Rust at all in my job. It's C++. So if that's the case, why am I up here talking to you about Rust today? Well, learning Rust has helped make me a better C++ programmer. And even if you're not a C++ programmer, I hope to convince you today that learning Rust could make you a better Java programmer, or Ruby, or whatever it is that you do. And this is because resource really, Rust really helps you um, get a clear understanding of resources and ownership and lifetimes, which are concepts that really exist in any language. Now, why I chose to focus on concurrency for this talk, um, of all the things I could say about Rust, is because it's, um, it's hard and it's worth doing. Um, now, what makes it hard, you know, concurrency is when mul we arrange our programs so that multiple parts can overlap. That's the shortest definition I can come up with for, for concurrency. So, as a result, you don't know exactly what order things are going to run in, and they're going to run in a different order every time you run the program, perhaps. So, uh, as a result, it's really hard to reason about what exactly your program is going to do. So, that makes it hard. Now, why it's worth doing is that concurrency, of course, can, can unlock um, uh, uh, speed ups for your program or, or uh, more, make your programs more responsive, and that's a better experience for, for your customers. So um, that's, that's something hard and worth doing. Now let's talk a little bit about what makes concurrency hard as we work on it. First of all, when I work on uh, concurrent, when I want to make a program concurrent, I have to come up with a new algorithm, which is concurrent. And so that's, that's work that I have to do. Uh, but when I do this, it's not like a traditional refactoring, right? I've, you know, we've got we've to come up with, of course, we're, we're going to run our tests and make sure our tests pass, but the tests don't necessarily save us. Um, it's because we can't predict exactly what order things are going to run in. It's much more common with concurrency uh, to have a problem that, only, you only find out when you release it to production and 5% of your customers have some problem, right? Uh, that's not fun. Um, and so, as a result, we have to use our brains to figure out if our program is correct or not. And, uh, you know, we only have so much mental capacity if we're thinking about, oh, what effect is this line of code going to have uh, on some other line that I wrote a month ago or that someone else wrote in some other part of my program, well, that's, that's a real heavy mental tax for us. And then, of course, this leads back into now I've got less mental capacity left over to experiment with new algorithms, right? So it's a vicious cycle. Um, and this is, this is really, you know, what I, I think, uh, what, what makes it so hard. So, um, <laughs> You know, what I really wish I had when, when I was working on this stuff uh, to start with is, you know, some kind of genius expert sitting next to me uh, telling me when I had done something wrong. You know, quick feedback cycle, right? Um, instead, you know, what I had was staring at a debugger for hours trying to figure out how in the world did I end up in this state, you know? 
and, or, or all the, maybe just running something again and again, hoping to catch that, that rare error condition in a debugger. So this is um, you know, what, what makes it hard. Now, I want you to push this slide onto a stack. Uh, we're going to pop it off at the end after we've talked about Rust. But first, I want to show you an actual problem that I experienced uh, working on a game. It was about nine years ago. I need to explain a little bit about how the game engine works here. So in the, the game the engine that I was working on, there is a rendering thread. And the rendering thread's my main purpose is to talk to the Direct3D API. Uh, Direct3D, or D3D for short, is a graphics API. It's what we use to put the pretty pictures on the screen. Now, um, now, now uh, there are many things that uh, happen in this. I can't explain the whole API, but um, you know, one example of something the rendering thread has to do is ask the uh, ask D3D for a resource. In this case, I'm going to show a vertex buffer, or VB for short. It doesn't really matter what a vertex buffer is, is or what it's for. Um, we're going to think of it as kind of a closed box. Most of the time, we can't see inside it. We can't change its contents, right? Um, but we can, if, when we do need to change it, ask D3D to open it up for us. OK, open up the box. Now I can look at what's in there. Maybe I can copy some new data in, change its contents, right? And that is going to be used to communicate some data over to D3D. Now, uh, when the box is open, D3D is not using it to draw the pretty pictures on the screen. So you've got to close up the box again before you ship it off and say, OK, now use this. And uh, you give it uh, you know, about a billion other commands also. And together, it uses this to draw one frame of data on the screen. This is not, <laughs> not actually what the game looked like. But you know, it, this, is, this represents the picture. So. <clears throat> Um, you know, now uh, the thing about this is it has to happen 60 times a second. So, uh, you know, about every 16 milliseconds, we draw a new picture and we do all, the, all these commands. So now you're all 3D graphics experts. So, so let's, let's move on and uh, look at the other thread uh, that uh, is of interest in this. So I have another thread. I'm going to call it the main thread. And it does all sorts of things. But uh, the thing that I'm interested in here is it simulated physics. Um, so it simulated how things move around in the world, right? And um, so every frame, we would take the output of physics, and it gets written to a buffer. I'm going to call it the simulation buffer. So we make a new buffer. We write some data into it. Uh, but we want to use that data in order to update uh, the positions of the things we're going to draw on the screen, which means the rendering thread needs it, right? So we're going to move that data over to the rendering thread. Now the rendering thread can open up the vertex buffer, copy the data in, so that we can use it to send off to D3D and draw the pretty pictures. And because we're done with that buffer, we just throw it away. And we're done with it. So that's, that's going to happen every frame of the game. Um, and this works. This works great. So um, you know, uh, here's our pretty picture. Um, whenever we have something that works really well in a game, what do we do? Uh, well, we optimize it, right? So, so we can't leave good, well enough alone. So uh, the problem with this one is that you know we've got the simulation buffer, and every frame we make a new one, we copy some data into it, we copy some data back out of it, and we throw it away. Um, so you know, someone had the great idea. Well, you know, couldn't we arrange it in some way so that we can write straight into that VB and cut out the middleman, right? So I'll show you how we can do this better version um, and. This is the part, by the way, that had the bug. So uh, instead of a VB being normally closed, let's make it normally open. Right? And let's arrange for it to be accessible by the main thread as well. So uh, now the main thread, when it runs its physical simulation, it can write straight into the VB. And um, we cleverly time things so that uh, we can guarantee this is not the part with the bug. We can guarantee that the physical simulation is always done by the time that the rendering thread needs to draw the pictures on the screen. So um, that means we don't need any extra synchronization, no extra communication between the threads. That we, We've timed everything perfectly, so main thread writes uh, whenever it feels like, because we know that's a safe time to write. And rendering thread closes up that box and draws it whenever it needs it 
and it just opens it up again and makes it available for, for, the, for the main thread the next time. So this works. We get our pretty pictures on the screen. Um, and we didn't need that temporary buffer. And we didn't need any extra synchronization between the threads. So this worked great, except very late in the development of this game, uh, I got a bug assigned to me. Now, I'm going to show you a screenshot of the bug. <laughs> so I, I know that uh, most of you aren't game programmers, so to your untrained eye, it might not be obvious what the bug is. <laughs> but uh, the screen's blank, and this is a really boring game. Nobody wants to play that. So um, yeah, so uh, this, uh, this, there was a bug in the implementation of this. And um, it was uh, particularly bad timing, because this is back when people still bought PC games off of shiny disks. And those shiny disks were already being manufactured at the time. So there wasn't a lot of time to come up with a patch to release uh, by the time people got those shiny disks from the store. Um, and uh, you know, uh, it turns out that this, this bug was due to a, it, it was a certain kind of concurrency bug called a data race. Now, we need to push this onto the stack as well. I will get back and explain it. Uh, what, what, the, what the answer was, uh, what was actually causing the problem at the end. But first, uh, I'd like to talk to you about, a little bit about what a data race is. Explain that. So in order to have a data race, you need at least two threads, and you need some shared state. And now shared state is just some data that, all your, that multiple threads can see. Uh, it could be one byte of data. It could be a megabyte. It doesn't really matter. Um, conceptually, we're just going to think of it as some, some box here that, that both of the threads can see. Uh, so let's look at an example of something we might do here. Uh, let's say that my shared say it starts out. It's a strange loop logo. It's a perfectly fine logo. But we want to make it cuter. Uh, so thread A is going to write this adorable puppy to the state. And thread B is going to write this cute kitten to the state. So, so what's going to happen? Well, it can't be both. Uh, it's got to be either a puppy or a kitten, right? Well, actually, it's possible, <laughs> depending on what happens at the hardware level, that you get some scrambled state that resembles neither a puppy nor a kitten. Um, so it could be something that causes your program to lose its sanity and um, do anything unpredictable, right? You don't know what's in there. It, it, it just depends. So yeah, don't do that. Um, sorry, clicker troubles. Don't do that. So uh, yeah, if multiple threads write to the shared state, at the same time, that's called a data race. So um, yeah, let's look at another example, though, here. Now, in this case, thread A is going to write Mr. Bunny to the state, and thread B is going to read the state. Now, is this safe? Well, you know, thread B might get the strange loop logo, and it might get the bunny. But, and this is a little more subtle, uh, and maybe less obvious, but it's possible if this write from A is not atomic, that it gets some intermediate state, right? So it gets something that was partially written and you know partially not. And so this is also not safe. Now I said the word atomic there. I, I should probably define it, right? Uh, hey, I got a slide for that. So uh, atomic uh, means that basically if one thread accesses state, that all the other threads if they read it, they see something consistent. Either they see what was there before, or they see something that was there after, but they don't see any kind of intermediate state. So normally, uh, most accesses to memory aren't going to be atomic. Uh, that's because there's some overhead associated with it. You have to do either some extra synchronization or use some hardware support for it that, that costs something. Uh, it's, it's, uh, so. Uh, you can, you can pretty much assume, if you haven't done some extra work, that your accesses are not atomic, and something like this would lead to reading an inconsistent state. So 
This is also a data race, right? One thread wrote, another thread read. That's a data race. Now, I've got a third example here. I've got this baby goat. And we all love baby goats. Thread A and thread B really love baby goats. And they both want to read the baby goat at the same time. What's going to happen here? Is this going to work? Well, the kids are all right. <laughs> Sorry, that was, that was my worst one of the day. It, it gets better from here. Uh, the, but, um, yeah, so, so, this is, so what makes this example different from the previous uh, examples? Well, in this case, the state is immutable. Now, immutable means that the state can't change, right? So you could think of this as constant or read-only. But um, yeah, if, if something is immutable, it means it can't change. Mutable is the opposite. Mutable means it could change. Right? And if we can guarantee that things are immutable, if we can always make our state immutable, then we don't have race conditions. And that's great. So uh, yeah, if you want to see a language that takes that idea and runs with it, check out Haskell. But this isn't a talk about Haskell. Uh, this is a talk uh, about Rust. And in Rust, as in most languages, we think that mutable state does have its place uh, when used properly. Um, I do want to say, uh, Sarah, uh, very long name, SGP, uh, gave a talk just before this, uh, Mewability, the Devil's Garbage Collections. That's maybe another reason you want to use Mewability. If you missed your talk, uh, look it up online uh, afterwards. I'm sure all these talks will be posted. So <clears throat> in summary, race conditions. Uh, if you have more than one access, so you, you access something from multiple threads, at least one of those accesses is a write, and those accesses aren't atomic, or you could also think of it as the accesses aren't synchronized, then you have a data race. All right. Uh, I didn't forget about Rust. And uh, at least half of you came here to hear something about it. So I'm going to tell you about it now. Um, first of all, here's Hello World. Everybody wants to know what that looks like, right? So um, Rust is known as a systems programming language. Uh, and uh, people define that a little differently, but uh, the, the way that uh, Rust folks think of it, that really means that you can access something really uh, close to the metal and uh, you, you, with, without a large runtime, uh, without a lot of runtime overhead. Um, that means you can get something as low level and efficient as C. Um, when you, uh, and and uh, when you look at this, you see you know, curly braces and semicolon systems programming language, it kind of probably looks a lot like C. Uh, to prove that that's not the case, I mean, here's another function. It doesn't really matter what this does. Uh, don't get you know, too scared by the syntax. But the point is, Rust also lets you express things at a higher level than you would with C. Um, and so you know, it's, it's interesting for that. It's also known as a safe language. Uh, it has a lot of compile time checks, compile time memory safety, so that your accesses to memory, um, you won't have uh, memory leaks. You won't have uh, 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 like use after free errors and, and all the sorts of uh, bad things that we might have. Now, garbage collected languages also solve many of these memory problems, uh, memory safety problems. But Rust manages to do it without garbage collection, which is kind of its neat trick. So in, basically, Rust is known as a language for writing safe and efficient programs. Now I'm going to give an example here. Um, this function declares a variable s, assigns a string to it. In Rust, strings are dynamic. So uh, I could add something to the end of this string, for example. Uh, so it could grow or, or shrink, which means that there has to be a dynamic memory allocation involved here. Um, so in a garbage collected language, such as Java, uh, I don't have to worry about cleaning up my memory when I'm done with it. Also, in Rust, I don't have to worry about cleaning up my memory when I'm done with it. But it works a little differently in Rust than in a garbage collected language. So here, S has a, uh, a, a lifetime to it. Or you could also think of it as a scope. So when S goes out of scope, then the memory that's owned by S is automatically freed. So the scope of a variable is going to be the block that the variable was declared in. So you look at the curly braces, and uh, you know, the last curly brace there that was declared in is the end of its scope. That's the end of the lifetime of S. And so 
the resource s is lifetime uh, ends at the end of this function, and the memory is just automatically freed immediately. I shouldn't say, I mean, it, the compiler generates that code, and you don't explicitly do that, right? You don't explicitly free that. I'm going to show you another example of something in Rust. And here I'm going to open up a log file, and uh, I, you know, left out that you can use your imagination. Where, what would we do with a log file? We'd probably seek to the end of it and write something there, right? So um, there's a new keyword here you haven't seen before, um, mute. Uh, this is short for mutable. Now, remember earlier I said that immutable data was safer, right? Um, in Rust, all variables are immutable by default. And that's because it's safer. So the safe choice is the default choice. So if you want to be able to change something, like a file handle, because you want to seek in the file and add stuff to the end, then you're going to have to declare it mutable. Um, and then uh, other than that, the in really interesting thing here is that I have an open file handle, and I want to close it when I'm done with it, right? Um, in most languages, you have to explicitly close that. But in Rust, uh, it's closed for you automatically when the variable that uh, owns that resource goes out of scope. And if that looks familiar, it's because this example is just like the previous example. It's the same pattern. And so the key here is that memory is just another resource. A file handle is a resource. A network socket is a resource. And these are things that you probably use in any language, no matter what language you're working on. These, these, these concepts exist. There's some kind of resource that you have to manage. And so resources are kind of treated uniformly in Rust. And uh, resources are always, always have a clear owner. So um, I'm going to show one more thing just to make something clear, in case it wasn't uh, in my previous examples. Here, uh, this resource lifetime function, we're going to pass in a value. If I pass in true, I'm going to do some extra work I wouldn't have otherwise done. I'm going to create a new log file, OK? And um, I do that inside this if block. Now, all my previous examples showed something being a resource being cleaned up at the end of a function. I just want to make it clear it's not the function, but the actual block that the variable is declared in. So that's the only real, real point to uh, get from that. All right, so we talked about resources, and we've talked about them being cleaned up in whatever block they're, they're in. But what if I want something to live beyond that? What if I want a, a resource to live beyond the function that it was created in? That seems like a useful thing to do. So here I have a function get strange. It's going to return a string. And my string, uh, uh, th and my string is in the variable s. And this is something interesting about Rust syntax. It may be familiar to you or not, depending on what language you come from. But uh, the return value of a function is just the last evaluated expression in the function. So in this case, s is the last expression. So it's just going to return it. You could explicitly say return s, but that's not idiomatic Rust. So here, um, this function just returns the string. Now, example is a function that calls get strange and it assigns the return value to this variable strange. So thinking about this in Rust terms, this memory resource that was created to hold this string is owned by s first, and then ownership is transferred over to the variable strange. Now strange is responsible for cleaning it up whenever it goes out of scope. And then finally, at the end of example, this in fact happens. So, in Rust, even when ownership is transferred, it's always clear who owns a resource. And we, we tend to think about this explicitly in, in Rust. All right, now here's another function. Um, this, this, one, uh, this one, I'm going to make a hello strange loop boring string. But I, I, I want to I print it out in a little more exciting way. So I've got this helper function hype, which is going to add some exclamation points to the end and you know really give a, an enthusiastic uh, output to the screen. Now, I call the function first with in some enthusiasm, and then I print out the original boring hello strange loop. Um, what do you think is going to happen when we compile and run this? Well, compiler says no. So what's this about? This is something that is a little surprising when coming to Rust. So 
uh, when you use this function call syntax that you see here with hype, uh, it's either going to copy or move the data into the function. And whether it's a copy or a move depends on the type of the data. I don't really have time to get into the difference and why there's a difference here in this talk today, so I'll just let you in that string is, in fact, the, the, a type that gets moved. So as a result, when I call hype, ownership of that string is moved into the hype function. Hello? Doesn't own it anymore. It's not, not our responsibility. Hype is responsible for cleaning that up. Now, I've intentionally covered up hype here with the error message. Um, we don't, just looking at this code, we don't know what hype does. Maybe it took that, that string and it's now, you know, moved it off to another thread, and that thread's executing and doing something with string. So it could be very bad if we cleaned it up at the end of this function. And that's, that's where this, this, uh, this concept of moving a resource uh, comes in handy, right? Because we made it clear that we don't own it anymore, the compiler will make sure we didn't, do, we didn't accidentally use this thing we don't own anymore because that could be unsafe. So to fix this, um, one way I could fix it is to add a call to clone. Now I've basically made a new string with clone that has the same contents as the previous string. And I move that new copy into hype. And this works. It outputs, hello, strange loop. Hello, strange loop. So that works. Um, but we had to make a new copy just to call a function. And that seems like kind of a pain. So can we do better? Yes, we can do better. So here's an example that calls, calls a function and we don't, we don't have to move the ownership. Now there's a little bit of new syntax here. So the first thing is I have an ampersand in front of s. And um, that, we, we read that as saying that hype is going to borrow s. So it hasn't, we haven't moved ownership to s. We've just kind of lent it for a little while. And in the uh, function type signature for hype, you see that it's got an ampersand from the string now saying that this is a string reference. Um, it's an immutable string reference because things are immutable in Rust by default. So hype couldn't change it, but it can, uh, it can use its value. And so this works. Now we've made a string. We've printed out, uh, we, we printed out the string with some exclamation points, and then we printed out the, the regular one at the end. Excuse me. <clears throat> All right, now I, I have a, another, there's something really cool about uh, borrowed references that I want to point out here. And uh, this is a bit of a contrived example, but it's kind of, it distills everything down to its essence, so we can just look at uh, the main point here. Borrowed is going to be a reference to S now. So borrowed type is a string reference, and borrowed is, um, has, has, is, has it in fact borrowed our original mutable s string. So while it is borrowed, and while that borrow is in scope, we can print it out so we can read it, but we can't modify it. We can't, we can't change it. Now here, I'm not actually doing anything with borrowed, but imagine if I were iterating through the characters of the string, and I had gotten to, say, the l in loop. Um, and then I go along and I truncate that string to five characters. Now I'm accessing a part of the string with my borrowed reference that it doesn't exist anymore. And that could be an error. So this is preventing us from making an error. I want to show you the, the, uh, the error message you get out of this. So this, this kind of makes it clear. The, the, blue, the blue shows you where the, re the, um, the borrow began and ended. And it says, hey, you did this bad thing in the middle that you tried to change it. I, I did not um, doctor this up at all. This is a screenshot from my terminal. I love these, these air mess. I'm, I'm going to make the camera guy unhappy, but you, you don't have to follow me if you don't want to. But I want to see this on a big screen. That is gorgeous. <laughs> is, it, is it wrong for me to have these kind of feelings about compiler error messages? I mean, I just look at that. <laughs> Anyway, I, I, love, I love that uh, it gives you su such explicit feedback. So yes, um, so, so this explains what's going on. Um, now, you can think of this as, you know, of course, keeping you from doing something unsafe within, within a function, but it also prevents a data race. Because if this reference were in another thread, I would know with certainty that it could, no one else could be writing to it. 
And that's great. All right, now let's go back to our example with hype, and let's make it a little, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, for, first, uh, how do we even fix it? We, if we move the truncate outside the block, um, of course, truncating it outside the block is safe um, because the borrowed reference has gone out of scope. It doesn't exist anymore. So um, taking away the mutability of something is not permanent, right? You get, it, you get your mutability back um, once, the, once the references to it are gone. Okay, so now let's improve hype. Um, in, instead of uh, printing something out, let's actually change the string. Um, we're gonna add some exclamation points to the end of it, and then we're just gonna print out the result. So this makes it um, you know, a little more generic. We could do something else with it besides just print it out uh, using this hype function. So when we do this, um, you'll see there's some more new syntax here. I've got uh, an ampersand mute to say that something is a mutable reference. And I have, uh, the type signature is a mutable string now. It's a mutable string reference. And this works just fine too. So um, here, again, we're, we're being explicit about things, um, more so than you may be used to in another language. But um, all these type annotations and everything are what allow the compiler to guarantee that all this code is safe uh, at runtime, at compile time. And there's also a very cool thing about mutable borrows, um, similar to uh, an immutable borrow. But in this case, uh, when I borrow something mutably, it is not accessible at all, which means if someone else can write to my thing, I can't even read it because I could have the problem from the other end. They could be changing it in uh, an unsafe way that I'm not aware of, right? And again, you get a beautiful error message <sighs> Look at it. Uh, with, uh, that shows you where the borrow begins, where it ends, and hey, you did this unsafe thing in the middle, right? So this, again, also prevents a kind of data race. All right, putting all that together, um, in general, in Rust, if you can read something, the compiler guarantees that no one else could be writing it. If you can write something, the compiler guarantees no one else could be accessing it at all. And in the case of borrowed references, that's actually done statically at compile time. So you don't pay any runtime overhead for this. You don't, uh, th there's no runtime check, right? There's, there's, there's nothing, there, this is guaranteed and the compiler is gonna tell you instantly when you compile it that you've done something wrong. Um, this is how we get efficient memory safety without garbage collection, but this exact same set of features also gives us uh, a compile time guarantee that data races are in fact impossible in Rust. All right, um, <clears throat> there is a downside. When you learn Rust, a lot of people feel it kind of, the compiler kind of gets on their nerves at first. Um, a common complaint is that you know, it makes you, it forces you to be really explicit about lifetimes, about ownership uh, of your resources in ways that you didn't have to in other languages, right? And this is, you know, it, it, it is some kind of friction. Um, but I'd like to flip that around. Um, if you are doing safe concurrent programming, you need to care a lot about resources and ownership and lifetimes. And the Rust compiler is right there teaching you to do that. So when I say that Rust has made me a better C++ pro programmer, this is one of the things I'm talking about. In fact, it's one of the main things. It's that I think I've just gotten a better intuitive sense for um, ownership of resources in my programs. It's just become more natural because when you get to that point where you're not fighting with the Rust compiler, uh, you've internalized it, right? And so. The concept of resources and ownership and lifetimes applies to any language. It, it, you don't even have to have multiple threads. I mean, there, there's unsafe things you could be doing even within a single thread. So my whole, my whole take on this and what my whole point here is that it's worth learning even if it's not what you're going to use in your day-to-day -day work. Okay, popping something off the stack. Remember this, uh, this error we had before. Um, in the rendering thread, the rendering thread is managing a bunch of resources, right? 
and it's making calls into D3D. Well, at some point, it makes a call to D3D, and it gets a fatal error. And what does that mean? Well, now all your graphics resources that you had are invalid. You have to throw them away, and you have to create new ones. And the rendering thread knows how to do this. That's, this isn't a problem, and every game has some code to handle this sort of thing. That's not really the big deal. But what happened in the case of this uh, optimization was different, different ideas between the two threads on what the lifetime of the resource is. So the rendering thread thinks that the lifetime lasts until it gets a fatal error out of D3D. And the main thread thinks the lifetime lasts, well, at least as long as physical simulation is running. And uh, you can't really have two threads with a different idea of what the, what the lifetime is without a confused idea of ownership. So, you know, when, uh, when you look at this, uh, you know, it's obvious that each thread thinks it owns the resource because they each have their own idea of what the lifetime is. And so I really wish that the person who had made this optimization had learned Rust. Now, that's impossible because it hadn't been released yet at the time that the code was written. But my point is that if they had, they would probably had a bare intuitive idea that what they had was a mixed case of ownership, and there was probably going to be trouble down the road, and they might have designed this a little better. Now, I'd like to say that I made this safer, um, because it is, in fact, possible to, with a little bit of extra work to make this, safe, this optimization safer. But actually, given the short time constraint, I just removed the optimization. And that got the game out um, in time. Now, popping the next one off the stack, remember this one. Uh, things were really hard to test, right? Hey, if, we take, if you decide to go a little beyond what I'm suggesting here and actually start writing your programs in Rust, not just using it as a tool to learn some skills, you get compile time checks that are preventing some errors. And that's pretty cool. That removes a whole class of errors. You don't, now you don't have to worry about them. And as a result, your mental overhead of having to work on current programming has gotten really teeny tiny, so tiny you can't read my writing. And so as a result, you've got more mental energy left over to experiment with new algorithms. Now, I'm not going to say that Rust solves all the problems. You can still have concurrency bugs in Rust, but it eliminates a whole class of errors. And let me tell you, in my experience, at least in games, um, Data races are the number one problem you have. So um, it's pretty awesome that Rust takes care of this at compile time. All right, one final thought here. There's a list of five languages every programmer should learn. If you search for this online, you'll find it. The only problem is nobody can agree on what those five languages are. Uh, and, and so you know, all I ask, really, is that you take your five languages, whatever they are, and you add Rust to the list. <laughs> if you do this, then we can still be friends. <laughs> can we all agree? OK. So um, here's some resources to get you started. And um, that's all I got today. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>